Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Climate Careers Chats. The Climate Careers Chat is co-hosted by Sustainable Leaders in Action and the Contra Costa County Library. We Sustainable Leaders in Action is Co Sustainable Contra Costa's youth-led team, and I'm very excited because this is my last Climate Careers Chat with Skoko and Slia. My name is Rachel Kimball, and I am very passionate about climate issues and I also love theater so the climate careers chats have been for the past four years basically what I love doing best it's great because I get to present and I also get to talk about the climate with people that are very knowledgeable about it like our panelists which I'm so excited for you guys to hear from today thank you all for being here and let's get started so here's a brief overview of everything we're going to be talking about tonight for tonight's program We'll start by introducing our lovely team. We'll hear from our first panelist, Lori Caldwell. We'll take a short informational break, and then we'll hear from our second panelist, Geneva Gondak. Afterwards, we're, we'll have time for a Q&A with the panelists, my personal favorite part. So please, if you guys have questions throughout the program, send them in the Q&A function. It should be at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them all at the end. Trust me, we've never left a question unanswered, so we're not gonna start now. We'll finish up with some closing remarks and then everyone will be on their way. Okay, so founded in 2020, the Climate Careers Chat are produced by Sustainable Leaders in Action, Sustainable Contra Costa's youth-led team, and are co-hosted and funded by our partnership with the Contra Costa County Library. And since 2020, we have had 12 other Climate Careers Chats, and we're so happy to be continuing this partnership with the library for this awesome program. And my name is Emily Ao. I'm a rising junior at Middle College High School, and I've been in um, SLEA for about seven months now. I love learning about everything science, especially chemistry, and how that could be intertwined with helping preserve our planet. Um, I also like to partake in ballet and playing guitar. I'll now pass the mic over to our advisor, Elena Betres. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Eliana Petrez and I am the Language and Program Specialist at Sustainable Contra Costa, which was founded in 2008. We are a community of citizens, educators, innovators, and organizations working together for ecologically sustainable, economically vibrant, and socially just communities for all. Um, together, we help thousands of people each year learn how to live more sustainably and make changes to save water, energy, reduce waste, grow food, and build healthy, resilient communities. Um, among other things, I am the SLEA advisor, uh, which means I work closely with our intern team and mentor them throughout their internship. Uh, I've loved working with SLEA for the last few years, and it's been really special being able to support our young leaders like Rachel and Emily in creating and realizing the type of programming they themselves are interested in. Uh, whether it's agriculture or water conservation themed, like today, I'm always so happy to work with our Climate Careers Chat intern on exploring fields that they are interested in or would like to learn more about and sharing that information with our community. Um, this program is super special to me. Uh, in fact, the first time I worked with SLEA uh, was when I took on the Climate Careers Chats back in 2020. Um, so including tonight's program, I've been the advisor of 12 of the 13. Uh, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our previous interns, Max and Mia, um, for starting the program off so, so strongly, and to Rachel for also being a moderator since 2020 um, and holding it down since then, and like she mentioned, being our outgoing intern, um, and to Emily, who will be taking on the role. We're really excited, and we hope you enjoy tonight's program. Um, now for a special welcome to our co-host for the event, the Contra Costa County Library, and I'm going to pass the mic to our wonderful collaborating librarian, Albert Garcia, who will introduce himself and then tell us a little bit about the amazing resources the library has available. Thank you, Ellie. Appreciate that. Yes, my name is Albert Garcia, and I'm Adult Services Librarian with Contra Costa County, and I'm very happy to be partnering once again with uh, Sustainable Leaders in Action. Uh, on these very important and informative programs. So thank you so much for being here today. Before I hand it back, I do want to talk a little bit about the library services. 
The Contra Costa County Library is happy to connect you with our resources, services, and materials at all 26 of our branches. Access more than 1 million physical items, including international language collections and thousands of digital materials 24 7 at cccLIB.org. Visit any library to use our public computers, printers, and free Wi Fi. You can also visit one of our branches with laptops for on site use or check out a Wi Fi hotspot for three weeks. Contra Costa County Library's adult literacy program trains and supports volunteer tutors to deliver basic literacy instruction to adults throughout the county. Visit our website and sign up for a digital library card today. Thanks again, and I'm going to hand it back. Have a great program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Um, okay. Let's give it up for our amazing panelists, Lori Caldwell and Geneva Gondak for joining us as panelists for the water conservation themed climate careers chat. We're extremely excited to hear from all of them. Um, now we're gonna play a little game of two truths and a lie to get to know more about our first panelist, Lori. I'll give you guys a little bit of an intro to Lori. Lori is an Alameda County master composter, a Bay Friendly Certified Landscape Professional, self-taught edible gardener, and residential sheet mulch maven. She recently received a technical certification from the Maine Compost School. She's been happily teaching sustainable gardening classes and transforming yards in the San Francisco Bay Area since 2007. Her mission to connect people to the soil and all that it provides. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. And now we've got two truths and a lie. So Lori, why don't you read those out? All right. Uh, two truths and a lie. Making jam is one of my favorite pastimes. I am horrible at sports. And I think coffee is gross. I personally think coffee is gross. So I hope that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> I hope it's I'm horrible at sports because I feel like she's pretty good. <laughs> Anybody else? No, the lie is I think coffee is gross. I think coffee is the best. <laughs> but um, yes, I am horrible at sports. It requires some eye hand coordination that I do not exist that I do not possess. And I do love making jam. <clears throat> What's your favorite kind of jam to make? Whatever fruit I can get I hit my hands on, usually. <laughs> Sometimes I get calls from friends. Hey, my plum tree is, you know, is happening. Do you want to come? Then we have, you know, we have plum jam. Or I have clients who have a lot of fruit trees. So I bring home lots of extra fruit. So as, as long as I have enough sugar and enough pectin and enough jars, I'll make jam pretty much out of anything, pretty much. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a great perk of your job. <laughs> it is a great perk. <clears throat> absolutely okay. we want to hear more about what you do as a panelist and as a person as a climate professional so why don't you take it away and show us your presentation all right thank you everybody for coming let me start from the beginning come on now all right So before I uh, actually start this, uh, it was been a, it was actually interesting, very interesting exercise having to kind of go back into my past <laughs> and see where I came from. Um, my journey uh, doesn't necessarily start with a slide. The journey actually starts um, a few years before my actual journey started. I was working for a corporate catering company using doing their sales and marketing, um, helping out at picnics occasionally on the weekends, pouring beer, playing games, what have you. And uh, one day I decided that I did not want to do that any longer, that that was not going to be the trajectory that I wanted to go. And so I opted to go back to school and finish my degree. And that's pretty much where the journey starts. <clears throat> uh, this picture here is uh, me and my element. That is not me screaming, uh, unless that is a scream of joy. I am standing next to a large pile of horse manure and one of the projects that um, I'm currently working on. So that's why I call mine a journey of compost mulch and manure. 
So I was finishing up my degree at San Francisco State in 2005, and I heard a couple of my fellow students talking about a program they were taking uh, with the county of San Francisco uh, called Master Composter. They taught you how to compost. They taught you how to teach composting to the general public. Um, I thought it was a great idea, so I decided to see if they had any um, in Alameda County, where I was living at the time, and they sure enough did. So in 2006, um, I participated in the uh, Master Composter uh, program. It was a four-month program. They taught you basic and worm composting, and then they also taught you how to uh, teach it to the general public, and that was usually a project that went along with it. I had a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. Uh, I was still finishing up my degree at SF State, and so that opportunity to work with Stop Waste came up um, that following, uh, that early part of the year of 2007 by answering their composting. They had a recycling hotline and a composting hotline, the rot line. I did that for a full year uh, internship. I got all kinds of interesting questions about what to, what to put where and recycle and um, yeah, basically help people troubleshoot any issues that they may have with their compost pile. So I did that. For a full year, they um, gave me a party, sent me on my way, and then two weeks later, uh, our program manager, uh, Gene Nader, uh, contacted me to see if I was interested in coming back and doing some educational pieces with Stop Waste uh, in regard to their uh, Master Composter program, to ask me to help out with that, as well as asked me to help out with, um, they had a, a series of workshops, big friendly uh, workshops that's focused mostly on building healthy soil and uh, uh, water quality, building uh, habitat for wildlife, all the good stuff. And so I uh, I took that job in 2007 <clears throat> and I have been with them ever since. Um, I serve primarily as their uh, primary uh, educator. So I usually work with um, our partners in the cities. Um, Stop Waste is an entity in Alameda County which focuses on of course, reducing waste in Alameda County. So we work with schools, we work with businesses, we work with home gardeners. Uh, we do a lot of work with urban farms. And recently we've been doing a lot more work with things like composters and manure generators, generally where my, my job kind of falls in. I do education pieces for our partners. I help support our farm partners um, with their composting. We do compost technical assistance for them as well as we do videos and all different types of um, audio uh, programming for our YouTube channel. I do that that piece as well. Uh, we are also working with manure generators and to getting them to compost their manure on site. Fortunately, uh, herbivore manure is not allowed as part of the waste stream. Um, it can only really ever really go to the landfill, unfortunately. But since it's organics, um, is not allowed in the landfill, so unfortunately. So we're working with them. We're also working with large scale uh, composting uh, facilities in Alameda County as well. I was doing a great job at Stop Waste, so I figured I could uh, do the same thing for other people. And so I decided to start my own business. So in two, uh, 2012, I started uh, Compost Gal Consulting Landscaping and education. I started primarily with the education pieces, um, working with community gardens, uh, going to places like libraries, and also doing, of course, doing work with Stop Waste. I still work with them uh, to this day. This is a picture of me on my very, very first gigs, um, my very first on my own teaching gigs at the Lafayette Community Garden. So sustainable education for kids and adults, I started to do, I started teaching uh, folks how to sheet mulch and then started doing sheet mulch projects myself. And then that in turn turned itself into doing work around uh, maintaining people's gardens. So I end up doing a lot of garden maintenance. And the best thing about it is I'm able to apply all the other things that I've done in the past to whatever present job that I'm working on. So of course, I'm always going to incorporate things like compost and mulch as part of anybody's garden. Um, no toxins, that type of stuff. I uh, install gardens. I do garden consultations for folks who are not really familiar with their garden. We look at their soil. We look at their plants. I help them make choices. Sometimes I help them put the plants in. 
And then I do um, compost consulting, compost technical assistance for um, any kind of scale for either a home gardener all the way up to a very large, um, a large scale composting system. Just a few pictures of some things that I've done. I, I work with Common Vision, um, that's the puppet. I am, um, I play Worm, Harriet Grubman. Uh, we do some uh, videos about composting education for children. So I play in Worm in that one. And then just me in my element teaching, sheet mulching, or um, playing with compost in large scale composting facilities. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of working with a variety of different organizations over the years since um, since I started teaching. Um, I teach in a lot of the libraries in Solano, Contra Costa, uh, Alameda uh, County, uh, and also uh, in Marin County as well. I have great partnerships with a lot of the water agencies, um, and I help them do projects uh, primarily around sheet mulching. So sometimes they hire me to um, facilitate the sheet mulch parties where people just go to a specific site and we convert their lawn or whatever existing plants there are there to a nice drought tolerant garden, which is great. And then places like, of course, the Sustainable Contra Costa, Sustainable Solano, um, and a lot of other great organizations as well. Um, I was a big proponent of getting uh, additional education. So in uh, 2014, I decided to become a Bay-Friendly Qualified Landscape Professional. Um, so I took a um, I took a course for that. And so again, it was mostly focused on the Bay-Friendly model, which is basically, you know, water conservation, building healthy soil, uh, protecting the environment, providing, you know, habitat for other things like wildlife and stuff like that. So it's not the kind of maintenance where it's like a mow and blow type of situation where our focus is to basically take care of the soil. And then in a 2021, I went to Augusta, Maine for a week and I got certified for mid to large scale composting systems um, via the Maine Compost School. It was a really great opportunity to see how they do it um, back East and um, opportunity to see people do all different types of stuff through um, uh, through composting and all the different things that they do compost because everything is, um, back east, there's a lot of uh, seafood waste, especially in Maine, um, that they are gonna be processing as well. And then recently as of last year, like I said, we started doing um, compost technical assistance um, with Stop Waste, uh, the organization that I work with still. Um, again, we are working with urban farms, um, helping them compost and process their um, their waste on site. Uh, primarily, we do work with a lot of uh, urban farmers who are either growing food for uh, to sell, uh, growing food mostly to grow food for distribution. So a lot of the, um, the farm groups that we work with are usually associated with churches. There's a whole faith food and justice organization going on right now where uh, churches have a significant amount of land. And so now they are turning in and get to um, places where they can grow food. And then that food becomes either food they just give away or um, it helps to um, help them with their uh, with their with their feeding um, of people, houseless people, regardless. Um, the one in the middle is the, um, the Oakland Zoo. We've been working with them. Um, to get their uh, composting system uh, back on track. Um, they generate about five cubic yards of um, animal uh, herbivore manure every day. Uh, and so now they are in the process of processing that down uh, into compost uh, uh, and are all going to be giving that compost away. Uh, the same goes for um, the one on the left. That's actually at the Presidio. We have opportunity to tour the Presidio where they... Um, took about $5,000 and they got a couple of blowers from um, bounce houses and turned their composting, they're composting a lot of waste on site because they're adjacent to the um, the forest, uh, the National Park Service. So they compost all of their material on site using an aerated static pile, which is basically just gonna be a forced air. So it's always keeping air going to help speed up uh, decomposition.
And that is it. Thank you so much, Lori. That was great. Thank you. Once again, if you guys in the audience have any questions, put them in the Q&A. I promise we'll get to all of them at the end during the Q&A session. Now, we are going to take a short break and we're gonna tell you a little bit about some more stuff. So we're gonna hop back on to the presentation that we have. Thank you very much, Emily. We've got a short three minute break for everybody to go stretch their legs. Maybe get some water for a little bit while we tell you about sustainable leaders in action. So Emily, if you wanna take this one, we're gonna talk about Celia. Okay, Sustainable Leaders in Action is the youth-led branch of Sustainable Contra Costa, a leading sustainability nonprofit serving the Contra Costa County. And at SLEO, we create the change we want to see in our communities by getting high school and college age students who are passionate about the environment involved in innovative ways that raise awareness about sustainability. And SLEA is like an environmental club, but isn't connected to any one high school. It's open to all in the region who just want to spread sustainable solutions in our communities. Yes, as Emily said, Sustainable Leaders in Action is a club that's not really connected to any high school. So we have a lot of people from a lot of different areas that come in to work on all of these projects. So if you join Sustainable Leaders in Action, this is what you'd be working on. You'd be working on the lovely Climate Careers chats. We produce a lot of graphics for that. So it's a lot of working on Instagram, a lot of producing different uh, infographics. So if you're good at graphic design or media design, anything like that, that's perfect. We have our bi-monthly newsletter. You see that beautiful art. Yes, you can absolutely join virtually. That's the whole premise of the Climate Careers Chat and of pretty much anything Celia does is that you can do it 100% online. We do have in-person meetings and so we can like meet each other and hang out and stuff, but it's completely virtual. We do have um, you can see the policy and advocacy. That's probably the most in person. I mean, based on past events, we've had protests and rallies and that kind of thing. So it's every once in a while that we meet in person. But that that area is pretty cool. We've got a whole bunch of fundraising going on and a lot of just pretty much anything you want to work on. You absolutely can. I bounced around personally on a couple different projects before I found the Climate Careers Chat because I knew I liked climate advocacy, but I didn't know just where I fit into that. I found the Climate Careers Chat. It was great. So if you want, if you really like art, you really like presenting, you really like policy and advocacy, or just like chilling out and talking about climate, like we have something for you. Trust. We got you. So join the Climate Careers Chats. Join Sustainable Leaders in Action. Follow us on Instagram at Sustainable X Leaders, and we'll have plenty more information for you at the end as well. Next up, we got an overview of the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge from Ellie. All right, everyone. Um, so the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge is a free website that's available in English and Spanish um, where you'll find actual steps, rebates, and resources um, to save water, energy, waste, and money. Um, this is a free online platform. Um, one of the ways that you get involved in this is by um, making a profile for your household when you sign up. Signing up takes less than a minute. Um, as you can see, we have over 5,000 households signed up already, and we are on track to meet our goal of 6,500 um, by the end of the year. Um, Across those 5,000 members, we have saved 54,787 gallons of gas, 
1,928 gallons of water. Um, and we're still going. So if you are wondering how to do this, next slide, please. We have over 90 actions that you can take to do these things. So our actions um, are essentially how-to guides with resources based on your zip code um, and that help you find rebates, help you read all about the action you want to do and is divided into different categories. So as you can see, we have um, how to be energy smart, how to have a clean energy home, how to shift your ride, um, community and learning, eating green and wasting less. And this is um, a screenshot of our Be Water Wise category. Um, so you have a little explanation about water and water conservation. And then the row below that are the actions um, themselves. So we have different levels of difficulty for these actions. So the ones um, that you can see right now, wash clothes wisely, which means filling up um, the clothes washer every time that you do a load of laundry or turning off the faucet when you're brushing your teeth or washing the dishes or taking shorter showers. So those are, all sound like things that at least for me are manageable. Um, and that's our whole goal is to try and um, provide all of these options so that, that you can see uh, which ones would be able to be incorporated into your daily lives. Um, so to join the challenge, you can scan the QR code right there, um, or you can go to cleanercontrapasta.org. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, now we're gonna hear from our second panelist, Geneva Gondak. Geneva is a supervisor from the water conservation at the East Bay Municipal Utility District, or EB Mud for short a public water waste and water utility in the San Francisco Bay Area, serving 1.4 million people. She works on public facing initiatives aimed to reduce water demand to respond to short term drought and long term notification in California. Her team's programs include residentially focused education and incentives for actions like converting lawns to low water use landscapes, in addition to working with businesses, municipalities, and other stakeholders to track and reduce consumption. Geneva has worked at EB Mud for 3.5 years with all within the water efficiency team. Geneva grew up in the Bay Area experiencing dry summers and increasing droughts within her lifetime. This experience led her to work in the water resources and specifically in the water efficiency sector. Geneva previously worked as a program manager at a nonprofit organization focusing on providing professional training and regenerative landscaping. Geneva received her bachelor's degree in environmental studies from the University of Pennsylvania. So now that you know a little bit about our panelists, go ahead and try to guess which of the fun fact is a lie and Geneva will read them out to you. Okay, here's my two truths and a lie. So number one, I am a kayaking guide in my spare time. Number two, I once biked across the United States. And number three, when I was in high school, I really wanted to be a weather forecaster. So what do you all think is the lie? I don't know if it's a, I think it's just in the chat or anyone out loud, feel free to chime in. Yeah, so to the audience, let us know in the chat which one you think is the lie. There is no way you biked all across the United States. I'm getting called out. <laughs> I see in the chat some different votes. Okay, well, I got votes for all of them, which means I, I did some good ones that are tricky. Um, so the lie is number three. Uh, I didn't want to be a weather forecaster when I was in high school. I actually put that in there because my boss at East Bay Mud, his funny fact was that he really wanted to be a weather forecaster when he was growing up. Um, I think in high school, I, I don't know that I knew what I wanted to be yet, uh, but I am a kayaking guide in my spare time. 
Um, and I did bike across the United States. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing now so you can go ahead and pull up your screen. Great. Okay, my slides are up. Can you all see them? Great. Okay, so hi again, everyone. My name is Geneva Gondak. Um, and got a long intro, so we actually covered most of this presentation. Um, but I'm gonna kind of cover my professional and you know personal educational um, experiences thus far that brought me to where I am today, which is at East Bay Mud, which is the public water utility. Um, our offices are based in Oakland, but we're throughout uh, large portions of Contra Costa and Alameda counties. Um, and kind of just along the way, how, how I got to this place where I wanted to work in water efficiency and in climate related field. Um, and yeah, it's so kind of doing this presentation, as Lori said, it was a, really a, a dive backwards. And I tried to go all the way back um, to high school, since I know that a lot of the, the leaders right now are, are high school students. Um, so I was thinking back to high school and I think at the time, although I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, I um, really liked, I liked school and I liked science and classes a lot of the time. So in high school, I took a ton of science classes um, and I specifically remember taking like AP environmental science or environmental studies, apes, I think it's a science, um, and like an honors biomed class. And in addition to just being cool classes, they both encouraged uh, me as a student to do job shadows, which was really cool. And so at the time I did two job shadows, one um, with uh, SF State's Romberg Tiburon Institute, which does like marine science research in Tiburon and one at uh, UCSF, which is the medical school and campus in San Francisco. And both of which kind of were very science oriented. One was in, you know, uh, like basically marine biology and the other was um, shadowing a doctor who is a MD, PhD anesthesiologist. So he did a lot of research around pain, which was out of my normal, you know, scope. And so I was kind of trying to see like what these other people did every day. Um, and, you know, on one side, I was like looking through a microscope on the other side, I was like reading a lot of studies and, you know, they couldn't do that much at a med school as a high schooler. So I was mostly just reading papers and like trying to summarize, you know, their findings. Um, but at the time, you know, mostly I was just trying to choose interesting classes and doing things that I loved. So I started, you know, kayaking and kayak guiding and I spent a lot of time outside. I grew up in the Bay Area um, and that kind of, you know, helped me to coalesce around like what I wanted to do in college. So in college, I um, went to school on the East Coast and I initially thought I was gonna major in environmental sciences um, since I loved science so much in high school. But after a little bit, um, I actually decided to swap and major in environmental studies. So slightly less science focused and I think of it as like, more people focused. So my concentration was environmental policy so really looking about how we can set policy um, to, you know, better the environment and how we can implement that policy, which is a little bit more of what I do today. Um, but at the time, I participated in a lot of like campus environmental organizations. So like I went to um, the climate march in New York and um, was like a lead for our our department's kind of undergraduate advisory board which was really cool since there are just so many different students doing different things related to climate and the environment. And to be able to like work with all of them on different projects was really a great learning experience. Um, and then I also, another highlight that I think kind of impacted where I got to today is I did a study abroad program that was looking at climate change through a kind of comparative lens in Vietnam, Morocco, and Bolivia. So I spent a semester basically going around the world to different um, 
countries, you know, on different continents that have very different biomes and ecosystems and also different political regimes. Um, and looking at how they all are dealing with climate change, both like on the environmental kind of science side, but also on the policy and kind of political side. And I found that super interesting. And, you know, it was really cool to like learn in an experiential way and to be, you know, it's kind of like going field trips to learn in person um, and talk to people who are actually experiencing climate change in different ways around the world. Um, and then kind of on campus, I also had some campus jobs. And so I worked as initially as a research assistant in a geology lab and geology was under our environmental science kind of department. So this is when I, when I started, I thought I was gonna be an environmental science major. So I was like, well, I should try to do some research. So I worked with a PhD student um, and I essentially it was my job to take samples of um, soil and get them to a state where there are just quartz. So we could see what the quartz content in soils from like various portions of a riverbed. Um, what that actually meant is that I was just like in this lab by myself in the middle of the night a lot um, with beakers <laughs> that I was pouring chemicals onto um, and then, or either adding chemicals, sometimes like putting them in these sifters, other times heating them up. Um, but I think it a little bit solidified. I didn't love it. I was like, do I really want to spend all this time in the lab um, talking to no one? And maybe it wouldn't be in the middle of the night in real life, but I was like, I don't know how, how much I love that. Um, and then to the, my other job after I stopped being a research assistant was to be a teaching assistant for some academically based community service um, courses within environmental studies. So these class, the two classes that I TA'd after taking and really liking, um, the first one was about air pollution and urban environments. And then the other one was about um, tobacco and tobacco addiction prevention. And so for those projects, to the bottom two pictures, we would work with schools in uh, Philadelphia to kind of co-teach science classes. And so one was, you know, about air pollution. And so we would use the classes, we'd bring in like air pollution monitors and the kids could all, the students could all come up with experiments um, and to actually, you know, test air quality and make hypotheses. And I think the poster is one of their, you know, results of where like they thought air pollution levels would be higher or lower and how they actually turned out in various places around their school. And then they'd like practice presenting. So as a TA, I kind of coordinated that whole effort and helped um, the college students come up with their lesson plans and you know think about ways to best teach air pollution and kind of science and science communications. And I really liked doing that. And so I think the two on-campus you know jobs kind of did point me towards like what I liked more, which was you know working with people and um, teaching and definitely all you know, things environmentally related, but a little bit less lab work oriented. Um, and then, you know, keeping with the theme of being a kayak and guide, I kept that up and also as an outdoor adventure guide. So I got to still uh, play outside and take people like backpacking and things. Um, so also while in college, and I think one takeaway, which was super helpful, what I, I loved is that I got to do a lot of different internships. Um, and I think interning was super, super helpful to kind of get to learn more about different types of jobs that I didn't know existed before going into college. And I think within the environmental field, it's a little bit less clear, you know, it's like when you're growing up, you might know that you could be a doctor or like a lawyer or you know, a professional basketball player, but like you don't really realize that there's a job called like a water efficiency specialist. So similarly, I like learned a lot more about other types of jobs. And so my first summer internship um, was out in Marin County in West Marin in Point Reyes Station. And I worked with the local, the West Marin Environmental Action Committee. And they're a small nonprofit and they do a lot of stuff, but I personally was working on their marine protected areas um, or MPA watch program, which is basically trying to bring volunteers out to the beaches and the coast areas within the MPAs to do like citizen science monitoring of how people were using the MPAs. 
And then at the time we kind of try, we're like, what will make people come out to the beaches to participate in citizen science? And we're like, people love a beach cleanup. And so we kind of combined and made them beach cleanup activities. And then we're like, what will make them have even more fun? And we're like, art. So I, you know, started doing all these art projects with like marine debris that we were finding on the beaches and on driftwood. And so we like went to the California Academy of Sciences and helped people like do art projects um, and also just at like farmers markets and things like anything to kind of bring them in to start talking about uh, marine protected areas and um, plastic pollution and kind of these other uh, coalescing issues. So that was pretty fun and very local and like a small organization around here. Um, and then the next year I did an internship, very not local. And I went to India for the summer to uh, central India and Madhya Pradesh, which is like smack in the middle of India in a very rural area. And I interned at this um, NGO and I, they did a lot of work, but I specifically was working on water projects and, and kind of a little bit ag, but basically are trying to help um, farmers build small and like medium scale water infrastructure projects to better store and capture water on their properties via like farm ponds and different um, kind of improvements so that they were, you know, rather than in, really depleting the groundwater supply via you know really intensive irrigation in um, the dry season they could instead you know have a little bit of a or hopefully have a more reliable water supply as you know with really with climate change the water supply was becoming less and less reliable and the monsoon season was becoming less and less dependent or regular so that was like a super interesting learning experience. I did a whole bunch of different jobs and really was just around trying to learn. Um, and the pictures there, I think I'm like eating yogurt on a site visit on the ground and taking a picture of one of those infrastructure projects. And I think out on, I think someone on an ag, like on another site visit, probably talking to different farmers. Um, and that was just a really cool experience that I got connected through through my university. So another thing to like, Keep your ears open. I feel like colleges have all these different programs that are hard to know about, but if you hear about and you're like, that sounds cool, like follow up and definitely try to do it, apply whatever needs to happen. Um, since they, I was able to like get some funding to, to make it possible to do something like that, that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Um, and then finally I did, so I kind of went to two nonprofit internships. I was like, you know, I want to try out the government. <laughs> And I was really into outdoor recreation and the environment together. So I thought, what a great place to work, the National Park Service. So I did an internship in Washington, DC uh, at the National Park Service, which is in the Department of the Interior. And specifically, I would, did an internship with the Conservation and Outdoor Recreation Group, which is a pretty niche, funky group. Um, and with that, like with their Rivers Trails Conservation Assistance Program, which is even more niche, and it's basically like 62 people who are put across the country and they do project assistance on local uh, outdoor recreation and conservation projects. So if you need like technical assistance to put in a new, you know, rail trail, uh, like a bike path, and you're like, I don't know where to start, you could apply for technical assistance from the National Park Service. and someone can like come and help you basically for a few years. Um, and I thought that was really cool. And so I worked with them for the summer and it did um, kind of some different like scoping projects out of DC, like talking to all of our um, reps who were in the various field offices. And I liked it a lot. And so I planned to actually work for them initially after college. And I had been talking to them, you know, after finishing my internship and they, wanted to hire me. Um, and so I was like, great, this is the best news ever. And I was gonna actually stay on the East Coast and work for them. Um, however, it was also a good lesson learned in um, starting, you know, working in the real world and um, also in, in government hiring processes, which are unfortunately often really, really long and kind of arduous. Uh, Speaking as someone who currently works in the public sector, I'd say there's some good. It's, you know, they're really trying to be, you know, pretty fair and equitable. 
the downside is it can be like a long time. And so because this team wanted to hire me, they had to first like try to create a position and then hire me for it. And even though I had had like a kind of a ability to get hired out of the internship, it still was taking months and months. And so in those months, I was like, no worries, great time to um, have some time after a lot of time in school. And so that's when I actually biked across the country. And so I biked from um, Virginia to Oregon with a group of other uh, young adults. We were all like fundraising and raising awareness for affordable housing. Um, and I was like, great, I already want to have that plan. So I was like, great, I'll do this for a few months. Like hopefully National Park Service, you will sort it out while I'm biking finished biking, still hadn't been sorted out. And I was like, oh no, okay, well, you know, I won't have an opportunity to have time off for a while again, which maybe I would, but at the time I wasn't sure. And so I was like, gotta take advantage. So I traveled for a while and I worked for the kayaking company that I worked for in the Bay, but down in Mexico on the Sea of Cortez and it was going well, but eventually I, I, you know, I got home back to the Bay and I was like, still taking a while and then the government, you know, had a federal government shutdown. And when the government has a shutdown, they don't have funding. And most of the like non-essential employees are furloughed. So all of a sudden the people who were trying to hire me, like couldn't even call me and it was moving nowhere. And this was in right after um, Trump was elected president. And so it was kind of like some changing moods in the federal government. I think all of those factors together made me kind of, one, I was not sure if this job was gonna pan out. And then two, I was like, the federal government has some of these, like a lot of bureaucracy and these kind of interesting swings where it really can go from one administration to the next and change priorities. And I wasn't sure how I felt about that. So I started looking for jobs instead in California, um, where I live, and I had you know biked here anyway. As so I was like, well, it's kind of nice. Um, so instead, I found a job um, at a nonprofit called Rescape California, and this is where Lori and I actually like our paths a little bit collide, since Rescape was born out of uh, Bay Friendly and the Bay Friendly Landscaping and Gardening Coalition. Um, which was out of stock waste in Alameda County, but it kind of kept growing. And so they decided to push it out as its own very small nonprofit. So I worked for this um, organization, it's an environmental nonprofit that's focused on regenerative landscaping. Um, so primarily we we're putting on trainings for landscape professionals. So that's like that picture on the left and um, the bottom picture, which is funny because it's actually at East Bay Mud where I work now. So we would do workshops, um, speaker events, these like qualification trainings. Um, and I kind of helped coordinate all of those um, events. And then I also would do a lot of like public outreach and tabling at different events. Um, and because it was a really small nonprofit, we only had about four full-time staff. Um, I got, you know, I had a lot of responsibility probably way more than I honestly should have right out of college, but also that I like otherwise would have at a bigger organization. But because of that, I learned a lot and I got to do, you know, a little bit of everything uh, from picking a new and like onboarding a new backend software for the nonprofit to like learning how to facilitate trainings um, to learning so much about landscaping and gardening that I had, you know, been exposed to via my education, but not like in a work context at all. Um, and I got to work with different organizations like East Bay Mud, um, SF Park and Rec, other government agencies, Steve Oakland, in addition to landscape architecture firms um, and, you know, kind of smaller, like com small companies, small businesses um, like Lori's. That are doing awesome work and so it was really cool but after a few years of that I um, was ready to try something new and to stay in the same field but um, I wanted to try working in a slightly larger organization and so I saw a job open at East Bay Mud 
um, on the water conservation team. And I've always been really interested in water and have, you know, especially water in the West and in California um, is, you know, really, we can see it. It's probably one of the most visible climate change, you know, signs that we're seeing now, like more frequent and intense droughts, um, just like a lot of things going on. So I was like, that is definitely something I'm interested in. A position open for a water conservation technician, which is um, kind of our field-based role. Um, I think our names are a little bit confusing. So in my mind, I kind of think of it as a coordinator role, doing a lot of um, in-person like site visits and audits and helping people with their lands, like lawn conversion rebates, um, helping people figure out like why their water bill is so high if they have a leak, um, kind of doing a lot of a lot of the customer assistance work. And so I did that for just um, a little bit and really did like it and got to know the team. And then a position opened up and in government, or at least for East Bay Mod, you can't really just directly promote people. You have to have a position open that then you know opens for everyone to apply to, including the public and you know the people on the team. So luckily, a position opened um, for a water conservation rep, which is kind of I'd say like a program manager um, rather than like a program coordinator. And so I got that job and got to act as a program manager for two of our bigger programs. One being our residential landscape rebate program. So again, that's like helping people convert their yards, um, upgrade their irrigation, things like that. And then also to manage our kind of online water use platform that helps customers go online and see their water use over time, get suggestions for how to reduce water use, things like that. So if you're an East Bay Mud customer, you can go online, you can ask your parents and find your account number on your water bill and see your water use. And so kind of helping um, better that platform was my other job. And then more recently, one of my supervisors was promoted. And so a job opened up as a supervisor, which is basically like our, our team leads. And so I applied for that, not, you know, really wanting it, but not sure that I'd get it. And I think my lesson learned here was always go after things, um, you know, if a position opens and you think you're qualified and you're interested in doing it, give it a shot. You know, you never know what's going to happen. So always put your best foot forward and, and try for it. I think because I hadn't been on the team as long as some other people, I kind of ultimately, or, you know, initially was a little discouraged and wasn't sure if I was going to apply, but then kind of, you know, realized that the positions don't open that often. And so that if I wanted it, I should go for it now. And luckily it worked out. So now I'm a supervisor on our team, um, which means that I help uh, manage other representatives, technicians, admin, administrative uh, professionals in doing all of the programming of the water conservation team. So East Bay Mud's like this huge organization. We have like 2000 staff. Our team is 17 people, so small portion of it. And we're fully focused on water efficiency. So we're trying to help our customers use less water is like our mission. And with, you know, the water energy nexus and basically, you know, one of the biggest uses of energy in like the state of California is water. So that's everything from pumping water to your house, for example, and then also like the energy needed to heat water. So when you take a hot shower, that's going to be energy. And so there is this, you know, water energy nexus, which really all it's saying is that like at the end of the day, um, when we think about climate change and we think about what we can do to mitigate climate change and to you know, bring down our emissions, one of the things we can do is use less water. Um, and then, yeah, so that's, I mean, I think that kind of, there's a lot of strong climate connections, which I liked in the role. Um, and then another thing I like about my job is that Although, you know, we have a really specific purview of water efficiency, my actual day-to-day -day work is pretty varied. And so I put in the pictures here, um, for example, sometimes we're out, I'm out in the public uh, giving presentations like this. So this is just a kind of, you know, a really fun one, which I enjoy. Or tabling at events. This is at a water-wise garden tour. Um, or sometimes, you know, 
I'm at my desk. And so that's that bottom picture, you know, typing away or on a lot of meetings and, you know, talking to my team, talking to outside groups, talking to different internals, you know, stakeholders at East Bay Mud, all trying to work together to, you know, further our kind of six major program areas and ultimately, you know, further water efficiency goals in our service area. And so kind of, yeah, what am I doing at East Bay Mud? A little bit of everything. Um, so, you know, we, as a reference, again, are kind of Alameda Contra Costa, so we're that whole service area, and our water is actually coming from the Sierra Nevada mountains and from the McCullamy watershed. So it's going all the way down to our service area and then to all of our customers. And we are a government agency. We're um, like a special district, but we have, you know, you, if you live in our service area, have a um, elected board member on our board of directors. Um, so you can, you know, if you're over 18 or when you are, you get to vote for them. Um, and they're who, you know, kind of governs how we run. And then we're working to help people figure out what their water use is and then figure out how to save water. So we're encouraging people, you know, to save water indoors. And then a lot of it is to save water outdoors since that's where like, you know, a ton of discretionary water use is. So that's kind of like water use that you could bring down. Like, you can take shorter showers. You can't not shower. Like, I hope you don't not shower. But, you know, if you have a huge lawn, some, you know, there are recreational uses of lawn, but like, if you just have one, you're just looking at, and the only time you're ever on it is because you're on mowing it, you know, standing behind a lawnmower. Do you really need that lawn? You know, instead we could be picking California native plants, other, you know, low water plants that are going to support our local biodiversity, use a lot less water um, and just generally, you know, support our environment. And so that's like a ton of our programming. And that's where Lori helps us up a lot. And she's given a lot of really great workshops on sheet mulching, like she said, um, and other topics. Um, it's great. And yeah, I think I like water conservation because there are a lot of these multi-benefits. So when we're like saving water, we're not just doing it to simply use less water. We're also gonna ultimately be supporting our, our watershed and our environment either by, you know, putting in those native plants or, you know, by using less water, we have more cold water to do cold water pulses up in the McCullamy, which supports um, the Chinook salmon. So it kind of all comes together, which I think is, a, is really cool. Um, yeah, and then I think what's next. So I think one of the cool other things is that like, although I did my, initial undergraduate degree, I never want to stop learning. So I'm starting a master's of public administration, which is a master's degree uh, in the fall at SF State. So hopefully one day I'll be also an SF State alum, glorious. Um, and then I hope to stay in the environmental field. You know, I really like my job at East Bay Mud. I have no plans to leave anytime soon, but also, you know, at some point in the future, there's likelihood that I'll, you know, look for other jobs just to keep learning and growing. Um, and I do really want to stay in this field because I think that, you know, work on the climate and, and the environment is really critical. Um, and yeah, so I'm just trying to hope to continue to grow my skill set so that I can be helpful and effective in this job and any future ones. Um, yeah. And if anyone wants to reach out to me after, I always feel free to email or I don't post much on LinkedIn, but like find me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to answer questions in the future too. Thank you so much, Geneva. It's really cool that you and Lori like cross paths like that. That's really neat. Yeah, yeah, she, it is. It's, I think the that's the other thing. The world of like water conservation and even the environment in the Bay is, is kind of small, I'd say. So I feel like you often run into, in a good way, you know, the same characters. And that's another thing is, you know, you can always like participate in um, like professional organizations, I guess. And you can see people at like different events or even just like going to workshops. Um, it's cool. That's awesome. All right. So now for our for my favorite part of the Time Cruise Chats is the Q&A time. So how this is going to work is everything that you guys have put in the Q&A function, we're going to filter to the two panelists. The moderators should take care of reading out the questions. And then we'll specify it's for, if it's for Geneva or Lori or both. And then you guys will give your answers and we'll mark the questions and it'll be all good. So I'll start off with the 
first one. Um, this is for, I think this one's for Lori. Where did you borrow the blowers from when you did the project in Presidido? What permission is needed to do a community project like that, like tree planting? This one's from Nina. Uh, so actually, um, the Presidio, they went and purchased it. Um, that's their permanent system. So they, like I said, they process a lot of forest products because the um, they're adjacent to the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, of course. And then there's the, net, the park system. So they process a lot of uh, stuff plus manure from the stables. Um, and they use the ASP system. So they just purchased them. Uh, and I've known a lot of um, different uh, uh, pe people who are doing composting who have just gone to places where, you know, where old bounce houses or broken bounce houses or businesses that used to provide inflatables no longer do that. And they just buy a blower for it to set up the ASP system. What was the second half of the question? I'm sorry, uh, Rachel. Let me see. Uh, what permission is needed to do a community project like that? Uh, like uh, community composting? Like tree planting, yes. Oh, uh, I think it really all depends on where you're planting the trees, to be honest. So in the case of, like if I'm doing a sheet mulch party, um, usually it's, uh, we used to do them for homeowners, um, but now we just mostly do them in public spaces. I'm actually doing one uh, this Saturday in Lafayette at a public space uh, for East Bay Mud. <laughs> yeah. And, and so we're going to be uh, just sheet mulching. It's too late to plant, uh, Too going to be too hot to plant. Uh, but we're just going to be sheet mulching uh, probably about 500, 600 square feet. So it's generally who you're going to be partnering up with and where the spot is actually going to be. I think mostly for liability purposes for the most part. <laughs> Interesting. All right, Emily, you want to read out the next one? Okay, I see the next question is also from Nina. I think this one's for Geneva. Um, what types of jobs does studying environmental science lead to? And in the same question um, for environmental studies as well. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think there's actually a ton of overlap. Um, so I don't think it's like, uh, you know, end all be all if you pick one or the other. Uh, I'd say in, for example, on my team at East Bay Med, we definitely have some people with stronger science backgrounds and then some people who are, um, did environmental studies backgrounds or even uh, like communications and different um, kind of fields like that. I'd say for environmental science, I mean, when I was, going through it and thinking about what I wanted to do. Like our department had a lot also geology. So there's a lot of kind of more research-based positions or, you know, some of my friends did um, environmental science and did like GIS, so like mapping work. And, you know, one of my friends works for the forest service and does like mapping, mapping surveying, um, for example. So it's like environmental science uh, takeaway, whereas environmental studies, I feel like means more towards like program services, um, sometimes government, kind of maybe more people oriented jobs. But again, I think that there's a lot of overlap and you know, you can often, often if a job post says one, it's like, we'll take the other. So I think they're a little bit interchangeable. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Rachel, you can take the next one. Right. So what other organizations are there like Stop Waste that work on food rescue? Are there any specific places in Contra Costa County? And this this is for probably both of you, actually. So, Lori, you want to take this one first? Sure. I'm like, like I said, there is the um, Center for Food, Faith and Justice. And I know they are not specific to any um, any specific county. Um, I know they do a lot of food recovery work as well, as well as, like I said, we partner, at least with, in Alameda County, the work I did was stop waste. We partner usually with these organizations uh, because they are doing, uh, they are doing food recovery. Sometimes they're doing food recovery and growing their own food. And so sometimes with food recovery, unfortunately, sometimes the materials show up and it's not suitable to make into anything or it's not suitable to um, give away to give away to people. And um, so our goal is uh, giving them options as far as composting them on site so they can support their 
uh, at least support their garden. So I would say, you know, Center for this, um, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of hunger organizations as well, and definitely most likely a lot of um, smaller organizations. Like I said, some of the ones that we work with are, um, yeah, most of them are, are actually church-based, now that I'm really thinking about it. McGee Baptist and Eden, and housing, all kinds of stuff. So yeah, generally a lot of them are faith-based, I would say. Yeah, I think that was a pretty comprehensive answer. I know, I don't think I have additional orgs to add, but uh, definitely a lot of orgs that are doing, yeah, food recovery for um, like consumption too, like you mentioned. The food banks, of course, you know what I mean? They get a lot of donations from supermarkets and sometimes farmers if they, you know, they're close enough. Interesting. Thanks, Lori. Um, Emily, you want to read up the next question? Okay. Lori Geneva, how much science do you use on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of technical knowledge? That's a good question. Um, I'd say, honestly, probably not that much. Uh, I mean, I think science is a, a large uh, term and, you know, encompasses a lot. And so I'd say I do a lot of communicating technical and scientific concepts to people in, you know, understandable ways. Um, I do like a little bit of GIS work, you know, I do a lot of work in spreadsheets, um, but a little bit less technical science, I'd say. At East Bay Mud, a lot of my colleagues are engineers um, and as a water utility, I think, don't quote me on this, I'm not sure, but I think our most um, common job classification is like associate engineer, mostly civil engineers. Um, so there are a lot of technical people who work for the utility and I think there are fewer jobs like mine at a water utility that are, are you know, very people oriented and a little bit less technical. Um, so, you know, another way to go is to become an engineer, uh, and that opens a lot of doors if you are technically minded. Uh, but for me on a day to day, I'm not doing that much, uh, like hard science. Like I'm not, we have labs and the water quality teams are in labs every day doing, you know, like lab work, but I don't do that that often <laughs> actually ever besides. Yeah. Okay. Super interesting. Thank you. And um, Rachel, can you take the next one? Yes. Oh, so this one's for Lori. How do you find outside learning opportunities for certifications or trainings in your field? Usually that stuff comes to you. So once you've kind of gotten yourself kind of ensconced in the organization that you're, that you're enjoying, you find that as you start to make these connections with people, um, that things just really start coming your way. You'll get emails about different types of training. Um, that's how I ended up finding about the main compost school. The woman who I um, learned master composter from, she went there uh, to get trained on how to come. So when the time came for me, I decided that that's what I that's where I wanted to go. So um, and done other other kinds of things, but usually a lot of things usually come across your come across your desk either conferences or the possibility of doing things like training i know for uh, the big friendly qualified landscaping professional um, we had to do some um kind of uh, additional uh classes you know to kind of keep ourselves in constant on that so you, you would just take all different things watership you know water workshops with you know east bay mud or um all different types of organizations but you'll find that once you get yourself kind of in there, that those opportunities definitely come, uh, they come your way as you start to learn more people and and people just start sending you emails, to be totally honest. <laughs> they do, they find you. Yeah, they do. Or they you, also or, they do, or sometimes you're like, oh, you know what? This may not be an opportunity for me, but you know what? I'm going to click, 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 and I'm going to send it on to, you know, somebody else. You know, because that may be something that, you know, it's so, especially if it's something that either I don't have time for or I'm totally not qualified for. So, yeah, I'm happy. To, I'm usually happy to send it along and, you know, spread it out wide because you just never know. That's awesome. 
that's great to hear that like things just come up. That's great. All right, Emily, you want to take the last question? Yes. Okay. So for both of you, any personal saving water tips you all have? Oh uh, well, I, I'm my person like use compost and mulch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mulch, compost. Mulch. Yeah, compost holds its own weight in water and mulch just adds on to those benefits. So yeah, definitely compost and mulch. Yeah, I love compost and mulch as well. Um, I'd say additionally, I think one thing people don't realize, and we did a survey a little bit ago, like almost 25% of households have a leak, at least mm -hmm. one leak somewhere. And I think people don't often think about leaks and leaks can are kind of on average about 10% of a household's water use. So checking for leaks often, especially toilets, which if a toilet leaks, there's no puddle anywhere. It's just going down the drain. So you might not even notice it at all, even hear it. So if you put some food coloring in the top of your toilet tank and wait for like 15 minutes, if any color shows up in the bowl, it means you have a little twit, like a leak in that flapper, the part that opens and closes. They're like, a few dollars at the hardware store and you can replace it yourself. Like even if you don't have any, you know, plumbing know-how. So that would be one tip I have is to go after this and check your toilet for a leak. Um, and if you're like a water, you know, nerd like me, another rec would be to get a flow meter. So you can actually just get a little device that you strap onto your water meter in the sidewalk. And that way you can get, you know, real time leak alerts and just also exact usage of how much water you use at different times of day. And then you can be like, Older brother, why are you taking 30 gallon showers? This is crazy. Um, you know, so that's another fun thing you could do. I'm also a big proponent of uh, hydrozoning. So planting, grouping plants together, planting them uh, uh, based on their, their water needs. So that's also very, very important. Just so that we, you, everyone's getting the right amount of water for what their needs are and nobody has to suffer too much or too little. Yeah, definitely. And like now, if you if you're just turned started irrigating and it's up for the summer because it you know it's stopped raining a little bit. Another one is to just do a check of your irrigation system when you turn it on for the first time. Come summer, often there are some breaks. You know, maybe a rodent chewed on some some irrigation tubing during the winter, and you didn't realize because it's going off at five a.m. So just doing a walkthrough of your system is super super helpful. Those are great tips. I think I'm gonna go put dye in my toilet bowl next. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, and you like you might find one. You're like, oh, whoops. Fascinating. All right, I think that's it from the audience. I have a couple questions for you guys. Lori, you mentioned that you do educational programming for kids. Uh, is there anything you changed when you do that? Like any of the presentation material that you change? Not usually. Um, usually, I find usually with kids. I always have to try to make it something that, of course, that they're going to understand. Um, I just recently taught a um, workshop about plants at the uh, Castro Valley Library. And uh, my big thing was plants are like us. You know, we all have kind of the similar requirements. We all need sunshine. We all need food. We all need water. We all need someone to kind of, you know, kind of look after us. Um, the only thing, the only difference is that, you know, we don't make our own food like plants do. So I think just kind of making it in terms that they'll understand um, is always easy and then always allow for time for them to, to touch stuff. So usually regardless of what workshop I'm doing for kids, I always bring my worm bin. And so in the middle of, you know, maybe like the hour and a half talk that I'm doing, I'll stop and I'll just open my worm bin and just let the kids definitely play with it because they love it. <laughs> Very That's popular. Oh my gosh, that's, that's really cool. Geneva, um, so you mentioned like you just got involved with a whole bunch of internships in college. How did you find these internships? That's a great question. Um, I think that I, honestly, so many different ways. So I think I, for the West Marin one, I just had been like looking in the Bay Area. I think I got myself onto some like email listservs and I think I actually that one wasn't I like reached out to them I was like because this was after my freshman year of college and I didn't have any skills so I was like can I be your intern and they were like 
Sure. I mean, I think I, I was like a part-time intern that summer and I was also kind of guiding. So they're like, sure, you can be a part-time intern. Like we have this MBA program. And then I think I wrote, you know, a more official little application or cover letter or something. And they took me on. Um, the other ones, I think the, the one in India I found through my university, as I mentioned. So I kind of was interested in doing some in the summer and so you know in the in the fall I was like looking all around just looking on like university job boards and saw that we, you know our center for advanced study of India had funding to do an internship if you you know found one and, and applied um and the National Park Service I think I found that one honestly like on LinkedIn or something I saw this post for like these special NPS interns for the the small little program that I was working on and it was technically just for graduate students. And I was not a graduate student, I was undergrad, but I was like, this is exactly what I wanna do. This is so cool. And so I was going to, you know, my senior year. And so I just reached out to the contact and said, hey, like, I think I'm really qualified. I really wanna apply. Um, I will be submitting an application. I don't even know if I asked, you know, I was like, it won't hurt to submit one. They can always reject me anyway. Um, and yeah, so I think just like finding, you know, lists, getting involved in any networks like environmental clubs at your school um and yeah keeping your ears peeled and then just like going after things even if you don't think you're necessarily qualified or eligible like who knows they might still take you <laughs> and it's always valuable to go through the interview process even if you have no intention of taking the job too yeah absolutely. I mean, just practice that real time this is how you do an interview yeah, totally. Like I, I like my job. I don't think I plan to leave it anytime soon, but I still keep my eyes peeled for jobs and sometimes apply as like a good practice. Like I should keep my resume up to date. I should practice interviewing. Um, yeah, and I think on that note, I, I didn't put into my um, presentation because it, they're closed for this summer, but East Bama does have a high school internship program. For this summer, it's already set. Like I think they're coming soon, but it opens every I think winter for to apply for the upcoming summer and it's a paid internship um, and you can be when you apply I think you indicate kind of your interests and then you get if you you know get in you get matched with a East Bay Mud team that does something along your interests if you're interested in lab work you might be you know at one of the system water quality labs if you're interested in environmental things you might be with us in conservation um, etc so I'll put a little link in the chat too thank you that's awesome um, so much. We have a question out loud um, from Zulong. Um, so you should be able to unmute yourself now and you can ask your question. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Laura, I want to know how do I get in touch with you? I'm in Richmond, California, so I don't know actually where you're located at, but I want to know I'm really interested in the work you do. And I don't want to know, do you do those in other cities? Like, do you train families on our communities on how to do the, um, have the knowledge that you have and the insight? I'm completely uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm right down the road. I'm just in Martinez. So, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, I didn't include my uh, contact information at the end of the slide, um, but I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to pass that along to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Sure, of course. Awesome. Okay. I think we have one more question from the audience. This is from Nina. Uh, what is some advice you want to share with people embarking on their professional career? So Geneva, you want to take this one first? Sure. Um, I think just, you know, keep an open mind because there are so many different kind of jobs and types of work that you could do um, that maybe exist that you might not know about yet. And then ultimately like, do what you like. You know, if you realize that you're doing one thing and you're like, I'm just not really vibing this. Like this is, you know, I, for example, I was working in the, in the lab late at night and I was like, I don't think this is for me. Think about also what you do like, you know, if you're doing working with your hands and you really like it, or if you're working with people and you get to give presentations and you like that, like there probably is a job that does, you know, uses some of those skills. So you know, ask around, see if you can shadow someone's job or just like chat with them. Say like, hey, can I ask you about your work? Most people will talk to you. Um, and 
I don't know. I think there's like so many cool opportunities out there and especially in the climate um, field and really awesome people. So yeah, keep an open mind, try new things and, and um, always reach out to new people. I always awesome. find, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I always find that things always have a tendency to kind of piggyback on other things. So always take advantage of that. So maybe you, sometimes I'll be working I'll just be teaching a workshop at a library somewhere. And one of the participants who were there that day will come and then they'll ask me to come and do a garden consultation from them. And then that may just be a one-off thing or I may now be maintaining their garden. So just under there might be a few things that kind of stack on and just like, um, like Geneva said, just grab onto them and just grab onto the opportunities. If only just to try, you know what I mean? Maybe public speaking is not your thing, you know, uh, but maybe you're, you know, you're really great. Like I said, hands on stuff, just trying to find what you really love and what you feel passionate about. Because when you feel passionate about stuff, it doesn't feel like work at all. It feels like work, not at all. I mean, there are times that I am standing in front of a bunch of people in a library and I'm about to speak and I, I, I'm in a moment that I'm like, I can't believe I actually get paid to do this to do this and every day that I wake up and I know like oh I gotta go and play in someone's garden today or I'm going to talk to somebody about compost or I'm going to lead a sheet mulch party or I'm going to look at elephant poop at the Oakland Zoo today so like my first picture just find something that you're passionate about um and uh and just kind of follow that it makes the actual work that you do, um, that much easier. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to both of you. That was like fantastic. And that's a great way to end our Q and A session. We're gonna move on to some closing remarks. You guys did a fantastic job. We're gonna move on to the next slide. Oh, one bag. We wanna to talk to you about the SLEA's Summer Art Contest. Yeah, there we go. All right, Emily, you want to take this one? Okay, so sorry. Um, this is SLEA's inaugural art contest created to envision the future you want to see and inspire environmental change through your art. We encourage all originality and creativity and for rules and how to enter, check out the link below and um, you can scan the QR code as well. And one winner per category will receive a $50 Target gift card. Um, please join. Yes, please join. And now we have some closing remarks from Albert. So we go to the next slide. Thank you guys so much for coming. Albert's going to end it. Thank you very much once again. Uh, it's another wonderful program. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, just a reminder that today's program was recorded and we will be posting the recording to the library's YouTube channel. Uh, I will send a link out to everybody who registered for the program. So you uh, feel free to watch that recording or share it with someone you think who would like to see it. Uh, in addition to that email, I will send um, some information that the panelists uh, would like to share, including any kind of contact information or other kind of resource links. So look out for that email. It will most likely come out at the end of the week. Uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for being here uh, for another wonderful program. We look forward to seeing you next time. I'll pass it back to the group. Thank you, Albert. Now we have some closing remarks from Ellie. Okay. Thank you so much to our panelists for being part of our program. I really loved your presentations, um, and I really was just so interested in hearing how you work with water I think that's just so cool and right like they're definitely not things that I think about on a daily basis but hearing about them you're like wow I didn't know that that's really cool um thank you Emily for all of your hard work on this Emily is our incoming climate career stat intern so we're excited to see which which programs she leads um Albert as always thank you we love working with the library um, these programs are always so fun. Um, and Sustainable Contra Costa also uploads um, the recordings of these programs to our Climate Careers Chat 
YouTube playlist. So if you ever want to rewatch them, um, I think they leave the library YouTube after two weeks. Is that? The recording? Mm -hmm. The recording stays up as long as the panelists would like it to stay up. If they want to keep it up, then it'll just be there. Oh, okay. Awesome. That's great to know. Um, and last but not least, Rachel, I can't believe this is your last climate career shot. You have done such a wonderful job in making this program like interesting and reflecting just on your excitement is always so great to see. Um, you started working on this program as a freshman in high school and now you're off to college. Um, so, you know, Leah loves you. We love working with you. Thank you everyone so much for coming tonight. Um, and I will pass it back for the final words. Thank you so much, Ellie. And thank you so much to our amazing panelists. This is my last one and you guys made it fantastic. You guys are great presenters and awesome to work with. So that was really an awesome time. Um, thank you for sharing a window into your lives. I think everybody learned a lot. I know I definitely did and I'm going to college. So your advice is like very nice and very meaningful right now. Um, if any of you are interested in SCOCO or SLEA or anything related to these panelists, you can find all of the information in the email that Albert mentioned or on our link tree here at any of these links with the email and our Instagram. They're both great. They're all great resources. The QR code, you're going to find that tiny URL um, to becoming a SLEA member. So join that. I want to shout out Emily. Emily is going to be the new intern. She's already doing a fantastic job. She worked very hard on this presentation. On um, We have a big script through all of this and she worked on all of that. So I'm, I see great things for her in the future for this internship. Thank you so much, Ellie, for like always being there for the Climate Careers Chat. You've been awesome to work with for years at this point. Oh my gosh. And Albert, it's always nice to see you. And our panelists, thank you so much once again. It's been fantastic working with Slia and all of you. So thank you very much. And that's the end of our presentation. Good luck, Rachel. Thanks all. And thank you, Rachel. Good luck, Rachel.